Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you have decided to join us. You no doubt know by now that we study these Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series on the Book of Luke is for the months of April, May, and June of 2015. This particular lesson is lesson number nine in that series for May 30 of 2015, entitled, Jesus the Master Teacher. And we're gonna ask ourselves, what made Jesus a master teacher? Why, why was he better than other teachers? And, and what, what was it that made people recognize him as the great rabbi or the master teacher? And so we're gonna ask the Holy Spirit to be with us and guide us as we study this lesson together. Can we pray? Our wonderful Father, as usual, we claim your presence, not because we deserve it, Salvation is never a deserved gift, but because we need it and because we thank you for what you've done for us. Now we ask that you'll guide us as we once again look at a portion of your work, your life when you were here on this earth. And may it inspire us to do as you did as far as we're able in our day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The teachings of and actions of Jesus gave him great authority. Why was that? Why were people, I mean, a well, number of... His ahead. teachings were logical, mm -hmm. and, and people could relate to them. They were, what a revolutionary thought. Yeah, what well, it says, it was, it was first John 1, 1, in the beginning was logic. And that's a source of, if, if it's not logical, if, and you're asked to believe something that is irrational, run from it. Yeah. Right back in Luke 4, as he's beginning his ministry, Luke 4, verse 31. Then Jesus went to Capernaum. Now he claimed that as his hometown during his time of ministry, a town in Galilee where he taught the people on the Sabbath. They were all amazed at the way he taught because he spoke with authority. Okay, now what, how does that strike you? What does that say to you? They were amazed because he spoke with authority. What does that mean? Maybe they're teachers that they've been exposed to in the past, uh, they couldn't relate to. Yeah. They couldn't understand their lessons, yeah. probably, as well. He wasn't fooling around with a lot of mumbo jumbo. He got to the core and it was simple. And he looked and acted in many ways like they did. He wasn't getting around in the best clothing and I mean, he didn't drive a Mercedes, no, nothing, nothing like that? Didn't have a Pope Mobile or something to a plank one? I was thinking more of long robes with gold thread in it and a little purple here and there. And okay. Jay, do you want to comment? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And again, I... Just laughing at Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, as you probably figured out by now, I love to pick up uh, ex explanatory notes from Ellen White. This one's from education, the book Education. When Christ came to the earth, humanity seemed to be fast reaching its lowest point. The very foundations of society were undermined. Life had become false and artificial. The Jews, destitute of the power of God's word, gave to the world mind-benumbing, soul-deadening traditions and speculations. Now, I hate to, I mean, I'm, I'm almost sorry to read that in light of some of my Jewish friends, but the worship of God in spirit and in truth had been supplanted by the glorification of men in an endless round of man made ceremonies. That sounds like it's something you'd read today or yeah, re yeah, relate yeah, to yeah, today. I was the same thing. It says, as it was in the days of Noah, I mean, it was, of course, Jesus came to the world back then, 2,000 years ago, so history is repeating itself. Throughout the world, all systems of religion were losing their hold on mind and soul. Disgusted with fable and falsehood, seeking to drown thought. I mean, thinking to drown thought, how do you do that? Alcohol, right? Drinking drugs and everything else that goes with it. You know, it's interesting, it, she says all systems of religion. So that doesn't just mean the Jewish, the, the Jewish culture in Jesus' day. That would mean, I would assume, um, Roman just about every religion that was yes. that was uh, available on the planet. 
He says, men turned to infidelity and materialism. If you can't believe in the, quote, gods that you're worshiping, what do you do? You say, this is ridiculous. Leaving eternity out of their reckoning, they live for the present. Of course, nobody does that in our day. As they cease to recognize the divine, they cease to regard the human. Truth, honor, and integrity, confidence, compassion were departing from the earth. Relentless greed and absorbing ambition gave birth to universal distrust. We're having negotiations, yeah. high level negotiations, and they seem to be going nowhere. And why are they going nowhere? Neither side trusts the other side one tiny little bit. Why are we negotiating with people we don't trust? <laughs> well, a, by definition, one side is. As part of the philosophy, if you're, it's okay to lie to infidels, mm -hmm. and of course, the America, the great Satan, is an infidel, so yeah. it's okay to lie to him. Mm -hmm. The idea of duty, of the obligation of strength to weakness, so the strong should be taking care of the weak, of human dignity and human rights, was cast aside as a dream or a fable. The common people were regarded as beasts of burden, or as the tools and the stepping stones for ambition. Wealth and power, ease and self-indulgence were sought as the highest good. Physical degeneracy, mental stupor, spiritual death characterized the age. Education, pages 74, paragraph four to top of 75. There's supposed to be some, some meetings this summer in Dallas. When, when are those meetings? Dallas, you're talking about some church meetings? Yeah, or maybe those are in San Antonio. Maybe I guess it's San Antonio, or maybe it's happened and I've missed it. But no, some, when is it? San Antonio, the first couple of weeks in July. Okay. okay. I, the reason I was, the comment you made a moment ago about these high-level discussions are going to be broadcast about that time, and I was just wondering if people were remembering what you're referring to, mm -hmm. and they might interpret your. In Talking about things going on in San Antonio, and really we're broad taping no. this earlier. So. No. So we're talking about what's going on in Iraq, I assume, and Iran. Well, I, the discussions right now, I understand, are going on in Switzerland. Oh, okay. We have to have a neutral territory, you understand. Okay, all right. Well, I just didn't want people to tune in and think we were criticizing what was going on in San Antonio. Is However, it? However, yeah. <laughs> 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 when I think. <laughs> when I read at the beginning of that, the Jews gave the world mind-benumbing, uh, soul-deadening traditions and speculations. We are the Jews of today, the tithe-paying, health-reforming, Sabbath-keeping people that w ran out and crucified Jesus and then ran home to keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. There goes your, t your side of the table again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lightning's coming, huh? <laughs> well, is it any surprise that the words and teachings of Jesus were so amazing and so powerful? <coughs> Dr. Luke was acquainted with Greek scholarship and education. He was a doctor. He had, I mean, he graduated probably from the, one of the best universities or whatever they were of those days in Greece. With Roman law and civil matters, he, he lived in a Roman community, Roman territory and with the ecclesiastical authority as demonstrated by Paul in his travels with the churches. So this guy had been exposed to all those systems, and he knew them very well. But after researching the life of Christ, he was convinced that the authority of Jesus was matchless. Think about that. It certainly wasn't because Jesus was born into some royal family or had some powerful earthly government behind him. He didn't, right? Yet his own townspeople, his own townspeople marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. I mean, how could they not have already been fully acquainted with him? Jesus' authority was based on the fact that he spoke nothing but truth. He lived as an example of what he taught, and his words demonstrated authority over death, demons, nature, sin, Satan, and disease. I mean, what does it tell you? I mean, look at, look at what happens on Sunday morning TV. 
people pretend that they can perform miracles. And what does that do? People are, whoa! And then they just assume that that's going to be the basis for believing what everything, whatever they say after that, right? Isn't that the way it works? Well, what do you do when there's someone walking around and he, he basically can control even nature? I haven't seen any of those guys on Sunday morning TV commanding storms to stop. Well, they're supposed or to stopping be a, earthquakes or try to get us all to do something <clears throat> about that. Yeah. You know, I understand our particular theology. We are anticipating that someone will show up here one of these days and be able to uh, appear to manifest those particular talents. And we will assume that um, just as these people on Sunday morning TV, that this is a uh, this is the guy that promised to return. Yeah. How are we supposed to relate to people who claim to speak with the authority of God? Test them against the scriptures. Test them against the scriptures. What a revolutionary idea. <clears throat> How do we determine if God is really active in any given information? Someone come, I mean, we're, we're teaching a class here. How do we know that, how do you know? You come here, you faithfully come here and listen to this stuff, which I sort of pulled together from different places. None of you have stood up and walked out yet during the course of a class. <laughs> I mean, how do we determine whether this is true or not true? Give it some time, let's see how it plays out. What happens, what do we do with the, with the writings of Ellen White? Can we know if she's really inspired by God? There are two different approaches to the inspiration question that have been taken down through the years. One approach says, okay, God is working with us at the present time. And if something he says now that we have just understood, perhaps, it, pre it takes precedence over anything that he said in the past. And there's churches that you can think about who have church leaders who supposedly speak for God. And whatever they say takes precedence over anything God has said in the past. Or even what they've said in the past. Or even what they've said in the past. Now there's another group, the, the opposite version of that says that everything God has said in the past is also true. So whatever someone who claims to speak for God says now, it has to, not to disagree at least, with what he said in the past. It may be something new, but at least it can't disagree with what God has said in the past. Those are two contrasting views of how inspiration works. Gordon, were you going to comment? Well, <clears throat> last week we studied about the mission of Jesus and you know, to seek and to save the lost was the primary text from the lesson. And then you came up with these verses that say, oh, it's much more than that. Mm -hmm. It's to show us about God. So, is that an example of additional information that we're given? Absolutely. Absolutely. Not contradicting, Not but contradicting. additional information. Yeah. Okay. Your microphone just dropped down, so you might want to put it back. Well, review once again the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we're, this is something we've heard preached about, people know about. Probably many of us have memorized large portions of it. And portions of it are quoted by Luke. Luke chapter 6, verses 20 to 49. He quotes some parts of it a little different than what we're used to. Uh, you remember that? Jesus looked, and I'm starting with verse 20, Luke 6, verse 20. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, Happy are you poor. The kingdom of God is yours. Is that a good thing to say to a Jewish audience in Jesus' day? That's complete heresy. This is complete nonsense. We know that if someone is rich, it's because they're doing good things and God blessing them, and that's why they're rich. How can you say, and, and the word happy here is, is the word makarios, which means blessed or happy. Blessed are the poor? I mean, everybody in the audience must say, huh, what, what, what did you say? You know? They'd never heard anything like that before. 
Happy are you who are hungry now, you will be filled. Happy are you who weep now, you will laugh. Happy are you when people hate you, reject you, insult you, and say that you're evil all because of the Son of Man. Now, are, do you feel really good if you're poor, hungry, weeping, and hated? <laughs> no. No? That's what Jesus says here, isn't it? What do we do with this, these passages? Well, it's interesting that this passage occurs right after in the book of Luke, which we think this is, he's, a, he's a little more chronologically accurate here, occurs right after he has chosen the 12 disciples. And therefore, a lot of Bible students have said this is an ordination sermon. What's an ordination sermon? Well, consecration of ministers as we do it today. Yeah. Consecration of new ministers. People are taking up their life's work. Some people have called the Sermon on the Mount the Christian Manifesto. What would that mean? Declaration of the Principles. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, in, his, in, in Luke's presentation of this sermon, he starts out with these four blessings. What are the four blessings again? Blessed are the poor, blessed are those who weep, blessed, um, blessed are those who are hungry, blessed are those who weep, and blessed are those who are hated, basically, right? Then he follows up with four woes. What are the four woes? Woe to the rich, rich yeah. woe to the, those that are full of food, mm -hmm. those that laugh, mm -hmm. and those that speak well of you. Hmm. So you're supposed to rejoice when people say bad things about you, but you're supposed to be weep or you're supposed to ter be terrorized when they speak good of you? I mean, that's got to be backwards, right? But what's the, what's the reason why people are speaking good or bad about you in this passage? They're lying. <laughs> well, <laughs> flattery. That might, <laughs> that might be true, too, but they're speaking good or bad of you because of your relationship to Jesus, right? That's what it implies, you know, the states. It states that, actually. So, how are we supposed to feel about people criticizing us or making all kinds of bad comments about us because we have a good relationship with Jesus? Shouldn't we be thankful that we have a good relationship with Jesus? Shouldn't we be thankful that they recognize we have a good relationship? Even more so. Yeah. And Matthew includes a verse that Luke doesn't. Matthew 5, 16. Remember what that says. In the same way your light must shine before people, not so they can make fun of you, so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. How does that work? Well, since we all have answers to that question, we'll move on. <laughs> these, these, things are, these things have enormous implications um, to us. Well, in, in these verses we just read, the terrors, things, the, the how horrible for you, what is Jesus trying to tell us in these verses? Would it not be true that for people who are accustomed to living the easy life, it will be difficult to accept the kind of losses that afflicted Job? Will not the devil do everything he can to make our lives, like Job's, as miserable as possible as we approach the end of this world's history? What do you think? Yeah. I mean, what does it say? What, what does the devil know? He knows that if, if we survive, if we stand tall, because we, we love God and because we like what He taught us and because we want to be like Him. If we stand tall on those principles through the final days of this earth's histories, it's curtains for Satan, isn't it? It's all over for him. Why is he going to wait till then to make life miserable? Why doesn't he do it now? Well, at this point in time, he thinks he probably is more successful at just making the world seem attractive and hope, hoping you're going to join the world just because it looks attractive.
To live lives according to the golden rule is a fantastic witness. Christ didn't limit himself to saying, don't hate your enemies. He said, you must love your enemies. Think of the incredible changes that have happened in our world as a result of nonviolent campaigns conducted by people such as Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. Is there a place for nonviolence? Maybe the opposite question, is there a place for violence? Yeah. Might be more questionable. Well, there's going to be plenty of violence at the end. But I don't think we're going to be doing it. That, that's a hard question with all the history I think of the Old Testament and mm -hmm. different things. That's a hard question to answer. I think, I think that there's, a, there's a danger here, too. We're so used to violence, certainly elsewhere in the world, it's very easy to get sort of inured and, and, and say, well, that's just reality, but mm -hmm. it's spreading. Mm -hmm. Christ is saying to us, okay, you're not supposed to judge. You're supposed to be forgiving. You're supposed to be generous. You're supposed to practice exemplary living, being tolerant of differences in others. And look at all the stuff we're hearing about being tolerant these days. He says, he goes on to say, don't call me Lord if you're not going to do what I tell you to do. But if you do what I tell you to do, I will take care of you. It was and is the purpose of Jesus Christ to create a new family to replace the lost family of Eden. In this new family, love is unmerited, non-exclusive, universal, and sacrificial. The door to this family's home is forever open and welcoming. So it makes a family. Is it shared genetic material? Shared experiences? What is the most important factor in our lives? Is it genetics or environment? We could have a discussion about that probably all night. Oh, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's, what's Jesus trying to say to us in these verses? But according to Jesus is whoever, you know, obey my father is my family. At one point he told someone was, when they were looking for him, uh, when they told him that his parents were looking for him, he said something to that effect. Yeah. yeah. He said, whoever does the will of my father, father. is my brother, my sister, my mother, didn't he? Yes. Well, look at Luke 8, verses 19 to 21. Jesus, and this is the passage Jesus talked about. Jesus' mother and brothers came to him, but were unable to join him because of the crowd. Someone said to Jesus, your mother and brothers are standing outside and want to see you. Now, this is a really important point in terms of understanding details about this family. Because of what reason? What, what does this, this story tell us about the relationship between Jesus and his brothers and his mother and so forth? And the father is not mentioned. So what do we assume? The father's dead. We assume the father's dead. So what does this story tell us about the relationship between Jesus and the rest of his family, his earthly family? All you people who have some orientation to oriental thought, you must respect your elders. Very, very much an oriental idea. And for Jesus, there's no way that these brothers could be younger than Jesus and come and be trying to tell him what to do. No way. So this is a, for someone who understands oriental thought, this is a compelling passage to suggest that these are older stepbrothers of Jesus, not related to him at all genetically, right? Because see, the only genetics, human genetics he has is from Mary, and the genetics they have is from their father and their, whoever their mother was, not from Mary. Just a little side point there. So, uh, do, these, do these words make you uncomfortable? Does it seem like Jesus is disrespectful to his mother? No, I don't think so. It was a question of priorities at the time. Because certainly at the end of his life, he hands her care over to one of his disciples. He wasn't disrespectful. 
Or was he maybe trying to say that his family was bigger than people who happened to live in his house when he was young? He was using this opportunity to emphasize <clears throat> his mission. Mm -hmm. But to directly answer your question, many have interpreted this passage mm -hmm. to say, yes, he was disrespectful. Yeah. But as you point out, no, he wasn't. He's, mm -hmm. Jay said he's looking at the bigger family. And Mary probably understood this better than anybody. So. Later she did, for sure. But we need to remember something that happened when he was just 12 years old. What was that? In the temple. What, what happened in the temple? I must be about my father's business. He was okay, but own. that doesn't correctly represent the original Greek, really. He said, literally, I must be in my father's house. He knew who, he knew who his real father was. You know, um, going back to this story of the brother of Mary and the brothers coming, what, what, what did they come there for? Well, I, they, they are, thought are he they, was... Are, are they thinking he is kind of out of control here? Yeah. And they've come to round him up uh, because he's creating too much of a stir, maybe embarrassment to the family, and everybody's asking them, what in the world is your brother doing here? Mm -hmm. And... Well, and he's and he's sending a message, possibly even to them by his comments that you know I'm, I'm about a I'm about a work here, a, a heavenly work that is beyond just this little family. And and their idea was you know if you could just be a little more understanding of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, maybe you get further in this world, right? I mean, doesn't that sound like a reasonable thing? They thought their job was to sort of instruct him. Well, after all, he's a teacher. Mm -hmm. He's kind of one of them, kind of one of yeah. those teachers type things. Here he's not fitting in very well. Well, what we learn partly in this story is that Jesus was incredibly ambitious in trying to tear down barriers. He turned two formerly demon-possessed possessed tomb dwellers into, in Gerasa into the first Gentile missionaries. What kind of barriers did he tear down in doing that? Matthew 8, 24 to 32, Luke 8, 26 to 39, Mark 5, 1 to 20. He treated the poor and despised as on equal terms with the rich and respected. What kind of barriers is he tearing down there? There was no difference in his mind between the Roman and the Jew. Whoa! I mean, how could that possibly be? He flipped the great chain of being upside down. Now, are you saying here his selection, his healing of these two um, <clears throat> demon possessed uh, demoniacs or whatever yeah. they were, demon possessed people, was uh, it wasn't just happenstance? He just happened to be going along and they popped out here, or he's picking these two? Uh, how, how when do he I could know? have picked some others, he decided, no, no, no I want, I'm, we're going with these guys. How do I know this wasn't just happenstance? Do you know the context of how this happened? He told his disciples, get in the boat, we're going across the lake. They arrived across the lake. This incident happened with these guys. The, the demons were cast out into the pigs and so forth. And the, w then the people came, from the area came rushing out and said, please leave us. We can't handle this kind of power around here. He got in the boat and went back again. They crossed the Sea of Galilee for no other purpose than to contact those, was, those demon-possessed men. Uh, to clarify here, was, the, was it on the way? Is this when they met the storm? No. Okay. No. <coughs> um, uh, hold on. No, you, um, you, you're making me think here. Hold on a second. Verse 22. I was, I was, I was thinking that they, they, you know, he calmed the seas and they were amazed at his power. And then there's a, and certainly a story similar to this. And then they get over here and there's two demoniacs coming out. And these guys have just seen him handle <laughs> nature itself. Yeah. And then they run from these. Yeah. They run from yeah, these. That w uh, this was after that. It's not, on, it's not on the journey, this journey across and back. The journey across and back happened right after he's, he's done that, yeah. <coughs> I didn't think it was a part of that particular story, but yeah, it did happen right afterwards. 
Well, even when healing with patients with leprosy, he pointed out that the Samaritan was the one person who came back and said thank you and not the nine Jews. What's he doing? He's still tearing down barriers. He traveled a long distance with his disciples into the area of Tyre and Sidon to do what? To heal one demon-possessed daughter of a Canaanite woman who wasn't even supposed to be there. She belonged to one of those tribes that the Jews were supposed to have destroyed when they came out of Egypt. How well are we doing it in our church at reaching across social, political, gender, and financial barriers? Depends who you talk to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tell me more. Well, uh, you look at the overview, we've done fairly well as a church, I would think, overseas in primitive areas. We don't deal too well with the more primitive lower stratas in our society. We're, we're starting to turn that around, but we yeah. have not done a whole lot with it. And we do very poorly at reaching the rich. Yeah. Why is that? I am rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing. Well, we're all rich. Well, uh, I'm speaking of ways, that's, yes. that's the attitude. Aren't we part of Laodicea? Yes. Well, we're kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, this story, this, this, this lesson moves on now to talk about the prodigal son, which we focused on last week, but especially the Good Samaritan. Now, this is one incredible story. What's going on in the story of the Good Samaritan? We told the young I'm teacher. I'm going to go back to these rich people. Okay. What are we expecting of them? Well, it would be nice if we, if they, if we, could, if we could demonstrate that we have something that they really want. Because that's the best chance we would have to try to actually and influence them. I mean, what, what, supposedly what we have that they need is the gospel. But they don't need, they think they don't need anything. Yeah, that's the problem. Well, I think our approach with the health message helps. Helps? It's a wedge, no question about that. No, but there's rich people in other churches and there's every reason to believe that, you know, they're good people. So what? Why in the world? So they, all the rich people ought to be in other churches, none of them in our church? Well, we got some rich people, but... <laughs> okay. But what are we... You know, some of these people, they... <clears throat> are we expecting them to be just like us, whatever that is, when in fact maybe they wouldn't be just like us? Maybe their lifestyle wouldn't be. You, you probably know that research has been done on Adventists. And it turns out when we first become Adventists, an Adventist, those who become Adventists as adults, they reach out to all their friends around them and they try to convince them that what they've done is right and so forth. By the time they've been Adventists for seven years, they stop reaching out to anybody around them. They now are part of the... They, maybe they found out it's useless. Well... Maybe that... Is that what God intends for in it to seven, be useful? In seven years, they become Laodiceans? In seven years, they become a part of the club. <laughs> yeah. Well, in this story, as Jesus tells it, and as it actually happened, what happens? A young man comes to him and said, what? Remember, maybe we should... What must I do to be saved? Isn't that, okay. No, who is my neighbor? Who is my well, neighbor? But before that, you know, that you're, you're getting a little ahead of the story, which is fair enough. Okay, look at, look at Luke um, 16. I can get to where I want to be here. Where's my... Here we go. Luke 16, we have the story. And what happens first? In this story, we, let's... We're not looking at the beginning of the chapter. We're going to look at... Um, sorry. Uh, Verse 19, rich man and Lazarus. Yeah. Here we go. But I'm 
Are you going to that first, or? No, I, I, I'm looking at that, which, and I'm not looking at, I'm sorry. I want to go back to chapter 10. Forgive me. I keep pushing the wrong button here. Mm -hmm. What's in chapter 10? 1025 is the Good Samaritan. Yeah, the story of the Good Samaritan. And I need to do this and go down to my Good News translation. Okay. Thank you for being patient with me here. Okay. A teacher of the law came up and tried to trap Jesus. Teacher said, what must I do to receive eternal life? And what did Jesus answer? What do the scriptures say? How do you interpret them? And then he answers his own question, does a wonderful job of answering his own question. You're right, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. So he's starting to look a little foolish because he's asked this very important question, then he answers it himself, right? Well, they were trying to trap him, and he turned it back on mm -hmm. him and trapped him. <laughs> and of course, as soon as Jesus said that, he said, oh, oh, oh but, but who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered, there was once a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when robbers attacked him, stripped him, and beat him up, leaving him half dead. It so happened that a priest was going down that road, but when he saw the man, he walked, by, walked on by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite also came along, went over and looked at the man, then walked on by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was traveling that way came upon the man, and when he saw him, his heart was filled with pity. He went over to him, poured, out, pour, poured oil and wine on his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own animal and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Take care of him, he told the innkeeper, and when I come back this way, I will pay you whatever else you spend on him. And Jesus concluded, in your opinion, which one of these three acted like a neighbor towards the man attacked by the robbers? And what did he say? The teacher of the law answered, he still couldn't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan, the one who was kind to him. Jesus replied, you go then and do the same. You know, I, uh, I have... I have to sympathize a little bit with the Levite and the, and the priest. Yeah, sympathize as much as you like. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, this, was, this, this was a treacherous road. Mm -hmm. I can see both of them thinking, well, I mean, these, these un untouchables and all of that, but I can also see them thinking, you know, this might be some kind of a ruse. This guy may not really be hurt over there. He's pretending to be hurt. Yeah. If I just take time to go over there and see about it, he might jump up and whack me and his buddies jump out. And, yeah. and so instead of him being the victim there, I might end up being the victim there. And then he could die and his wife and six children would be destitute and they wouldn't be able to continue their experience, their afford an Adventist education and they'd wandered away from the church and pretty soon they're, they're the ones who are bang, yeah. beating right. up people on the road here. So, <laughs> you know, That's how, a speculation. How, how, <laughs> okay, but I'm, listen, I'm, hold on. <laughs> Back up here a little bit. <laughs> well, isn't that it? You know, there are parts of yeah. town I don't go in over here because, you know, but I'm last week, if you were here, <laughs> we said that Jesus risked the entire history of the universe to come down and try to help us. Yeah, but you can't tell me there's not parts of the local community over here you don't wander around in at night or maybe I, even I, the daytime. There's nothing about having to wander around at night. <laughs> <laughs> I work in that community every day. Well, anyway. Yeah. Jim over there, he wouldn't go. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ellen White tells us some very interesting things about this story that most people are not aware. God in his providence had brought the priest and the Levite along the road where the wounded sufferer lay that they might see his need of mercy and help. All heaven watched to see if the hearts of these men would be touched with pity for human woe. And what did they see? By. Keep on. Right on by. Desire of Ages, page 500, paragraph 1. And then this incredible comment, 
this was no imaginary scene. This isn't a story that Jesus made up, but an actual occurrence which was known to be exactly as represented. The priest and the Levite who had passed by on the other side were in the company that listened to Christ's words. Desire of Ages 499, paragraph 1. Okay, now if you were the priest or the Levite listening to the story, what would you say? <coughs> What? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> that was someone else. <laughs> well, you see, the priest and the Levite did exactly what Jay did for us. What could happen to me? What could happen to me if I stop and help this guy? Yeah, well, Jim too over there. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> but the Samaritan asked, "What would happen to this man if I don't help him?" You think that was just the total thing? I think there's also, it was beneath them. Why should I be getting involved? Well, but not, not only that, let's be honest. If this guy, particularly if the guy happened to die while they're working on him, they're, they're unclean for at least a week. See, and they probably said, well, I gotta rush up to Jerusalem because they have duties at the temple. And these days they'd probably get sued. Who knows? Suit if you don't. But the question is, no. while the universe is watching, what's happening? They're thinking about me, myself, and me. I, myself, and me. We're not thinking about this guy. And they don't know. They can't tell by looking at him if he's a Jew or a Samaritan or a Gentile because he's been stripped. You know, it's kind of funny. <coughs> we worry these days about all the surveillance that uh, we are told is happening on Facebook and our cell Nothing. phones and everything. <laughs> Nothing compared to what the universe is. The universe is watching every <clears throat> detail of every person's life. That's kind of spooky. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving back a couple of pages earlier. Desire of Ages, page 497. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Christ illustrates the nature of true religion. Okay? True religion. He shows that it consists not in systems, creeds, or rites, but in the performance of loving deeds and bringing the greatest good to others in genuine goodness. The lesson is no less needed in the world today than when it fell from the lips of Jesus. Selfishness and cold formality have well nigh extinguished the fire of love and dispelled the graces that should make fragrant the character. Many who profess his name have lost sight of the fact that Christians are to represent Christ. Excuse me. Unless there is practical self-sacrifice for the good of others in the family circle, in the neighborhood, and in the church, and or wherever we may be, then whatever our profession, we are not Christians. Wow. Page Devar of Ages, page 504. That chapter has some powerful comments in it. <coughs> well, does the story of the Good Samaritan, while, um, while recognizing that God led the priest and the Levite to walk past that injured Jew and then arrange for them to be in the audience as Jesus told the story, help us to understand how inclusive God's family should be? How would you have felt if you heard that story and you realized you knew for sure it was true. Why do we do what we do? Selfishness. Selfishness? Are we, do we behave daily and hourly in selfish ways like Satan? Or do we behave in loving ways like God? Those are the choices we have in life. Do we think of the welfare of others before we think of our own welfare? I mean, this guy was, Jay pointed out very well, this guy was taking a huge risk, and not for one, not even of his race. Oh, for people that hated him. Yeah. <coughs> Remember that, in this context, more wars have been fought down through the history of humanity in the name of religion than for any other region, reason. People love to give religious reasons for their actions. They may not be true at all, but they love to pretend that they're true. 
Well, we, in this lesson, we suggest we were going to talk about what was the basis of Jesus' authority. What is authority? My Collins English Dictionary, fourth edition, says, authority is the power or right to control, judge, or prohibit the actions of others. The power behind authority depends on the source of the authority. Physical power, legal power, political power, religious power, <coughs> even the power of truth. After noting Jesus' authority, uh, just look at a couple of places. Look at Matthew 4, 10 and 11. Then Jesus answered, Go away, Satan. The scripture says, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left Jesus and angels came and helped him. Can I try that? Yes, I suggest you do. <laughs> you know, I'm serious. What is Jesus demonstrating? In the name of God, we can command the devil to leave us. Does that, is that what made Jesus have authority? Gave him authority in his life? I mean, you know, if you had a demon-possessed person who lived in your city, and he came to church one Sabbath, and Jesus stood up and commanded him, get out of that man, and suddenly he was normal again, would that impress you? Can I do that? If God asks you to do it, you can do it. How will I know? Well, that's up to you. Yeah. I mean, people have done it in our day. <clears throat> people have raised people from the dead in our day. He had, Jesus had and still has the power to destroy heaven and earth and to rescue his people even from death. Everything he tells us to do is ultimately for our best good. His words prove to be self-authenticating. What do we mean when we say self-authenticating? What he said was backed up by what turned out as a result of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, the way I understand, you wouldn't want to do that willy-nilly, though, would you? You'd have to be living a right kind of life to, to do that. What was it that attracted people to Jesus? He lived what he preached. Okay. But a lot of people who came to see, hear him for the first time, <coughs> they hadn't seen anything about how he lived. It's the latest circus in town for a lot of people when they first came. Okay. And what was it? What is it that attracts us about a circus? Well, it's a big show, uh, spectacular events, um. something unusual, <coughs> right? Well, in the case of Jesus, here's someone who was totally unselfish, living what we call the Christ-like life. It is really, is it really possible to live a completely loving life in the 21st century? Can we, can we truly live according to the golden rule? What would happen if we gave away all our possessions to the poor? Well, no, that's not part of the golden rule, is it? I'm just asking. Maybe it would be the same thing if we gave all of our possessions and, and put it in the offering plate. Yeah. Okay. God is trying to create a new family of Christians, a new family. <clears throat> if you want to join that family, what changes do you need to make in your attitudes, your thoughts, and your behaviors? Can we live self-sacrificing lives in 2015? We live in a world that's riddled with different belief systems. So why do we reject I'm just mentioning a few, agnosticism, atheism, polytheism, animism, other forms of religion in favor of Seventh-day Adventism. Are we just another ism? Can we be sure that we've chosen the right religion? 
Well, it wouldn't necessarily be based upon the fact that <clears throat> we were necessarily selfish, selfless, and no one else was. If you're going to adopt Adventism, there's there's got to be uh, something. There's got to be something in the message. Mm -hmm. This is uh, there are other people who are unselfish. So there's got to be something you feel something in this message that mm -hmm. uh, you we, feel we, a response to. We have been given, we believe, the three angels' messages to say something very important about God. And most people who read those messages get the completely wrong picture. <coughs> Society may be different economically, socially, and relationally now than it was with, with in Christ's day, but Christ-like life the, the Christ-like life is needed just as much now as it was when Jesus was here on this earth. And once again, don't take my word for it, I quote, Desire of Ages, page 24, paragraph 2, He endured every trial to which we are subject, and He exercised in His own behalf no power that is not freely offered to us. And again, Desire of Ages 664, this, this, well, God was manifested in him that he might be manifested in them. Jesus revealed no qualities, exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if they will be in subjection to God as he was. Did she intend for that to apply to us? Well, Johnny, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Don't put him on the spot. <laughs> well, it's actually thoughts that I think about myself, but it's easier to put it on him. On somebody else, right. Well, even though even then, in those days, Jesus' critics acknowledged that he taught rightly, without favoritism, and always the way of God and truth, Luke 20, verse 21. Well, so what was it that set Jesus' teachings apart from even the teachings of the Old Testament? He didn't say, thus saith the Lord. He said, I'm telling you right here and now, more or less. They must have been blown away by it the first few times they heard that. Not, the Lord, thus saith the Lord, the Lord has told me, da, da, da. But I say unto you, more than 130 times it says that in the Gospels, including 33 times here in the book of Luke, to indicate that his authority to teach, to seek, to save, to raise the dead, to heal, to drive out demons, to proclaim the kingdom of God, and so on, comes from who he was, and is, I might add. The words in the life of Jesus were unique in that he spoke with absolute certainty. There was no question in his mind without contradiction or confusion in all that he did. He was the very embodiment of truth. And again, I quote, in the ups and downs of human history, two laws seem to govern communities. First, it's the law of the jungle. If a person from one tribe kills a person in another tribe, the injured tribe goes for revenge, slaughtering all members of the first tribe. And you, you've heard, we've all heard about times like that. The jungle law takes revenge to its ultimate reach. Second is the law of reciprocity. <clears throat> Considered as an improvement over the first, this prescribes an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Does that sound familiar? No room for ultimate revenge, but there is some satisfaction in meeting out a punishment, measuring out the punishment. But can revenge or reciprocity build an enduring community and keep the social equilibrium at a working level? Mahatma Gandhi is reported to have said that even the lesser of the two reactive prescriptions created its own diabolical dread. An eye for an eye only ends up in making the whole world blind. That's well, and we don't realize it when we, when we respond to mistreatment that we don't like, something we hate, then we're actually becoming the like the very thing that we hate. And at the end of this sermon, Jesus said, love, well, not even, even in the middle of the sermon, Jesus said, love your enemies. Could we still do that? And not only are we supposed to love others as we love ourselves, we're supposed to love as what? 
as Jesus loved, John 13, 34, and 35. Wow. Now, the purpose of this lesson is not to present an impossible goal, but it's, it's to set a pattern, to, 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 re, to set a goal in front of us that we need to constantly work toward. Jesus calls us to love without any reference to race, gender, nationality, tribe, language, or culture. But it's so common for us to try to surround ourselves with those who think like we do. So, what would a new family built according to Jesus' principles look like? You can read all about it. Luke 5, 27 to 32, 7, 1 to 10, 11 to 17, 36 50 to 50, 8, 43 to 48, and 14, 15 to 24. And you've all read those verses. Luke reaches out beyond the parochial limits of Judaism to all of mankind. He talks of the new family established by Christ according to the following principles. Love must be central to that family, and in a Christian home there are no partitions. Tax collectors, Roman centurions, dead sons of widows, Pharisees of all types, prostitutes, society women, and social outcasts, along with wanderers in the highways and byways, are all part of his family. I mean, think of the stories that all those things talk about. Are those the people they talk about. Christ has shown us that our neighbor does not merely mean one of the church of faith to which we belong. It has no reference to race, color, or class distinction. Our neighbor is every person who needs our help. Our neighbor is every soul who is wounded and bruised by the adversary. Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God. Caste, anything that divides person and person, color, tribe, nation, gender, caste, language, or whatever, is hateful to God. He, that is Jesus, ignores everything of this character. In his sight, the souls of all men are of equal value. Without distinction of age or rank or nationality or religious privilege, all are invited to come unto him and live. Desire of Ages, page 403. In this lesson, we have seen some incredible examples of how Jesus' authority was based on what kind of a person he is, and he challenged us us to live that kind of life. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to learn, to read, to study about you. These things sometimes see way, seem way beyond us, but as we read your story and we're inspired by it, help us to move forward one slow step at a time in that direction is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.